One of the most mysterious topics in modern science, and the most attractive for science fiction. Some optimists believe that black holes can be used as portals to travel to other parts of the universe, but the mainstream theory still urge not to build hopes and illusions that, approaching it, you can even stay alive. In this issue, you will learn what a black hole really is, how they form, what types of black holes are, and what secrets they hide, as well as top facts about new discoveries related to black holes. So how did it all start? What is black holes? A black hole in the classical sense is a region of space-time, the gravitational attraction of which is so strong that no objects moving at the speed of light can live it even quanta of light itself. The boundary of a black hole is called the event horizon, and its size is called the gravitational radius. Black holes pull matter towards them, which forms an accretion disk around them, a giant structure around the black hole that spins rapidly. It is because of the matter that glows during rotation that scientists were able to detect the existence of black holes. In addition, scientists often call black holes objects that do not fully correspond to their exact definition but only approach them in their properties. This category also includes collapsing stars in the late stages of collapse. Now, in astrophysics, there are four main scenarios for the formation of black holes. First, gravitational collapse of a very massive star. According to this hypothesis, at the end of its life, almost any star with a mass of more than three solar masses, which has already used up all thermonuclear reactions, can turn into exactly this type of super-dense matter into a neutron star, which is necessary for the emergence of such a curved section of the universe. In fact, this is a star that collapses under its own weight, dragging along the space-time continuum around it. The gravitational field of this object becomes so strong that not even light can escape from it. Therefore, this region is called a black hole. Collapse of the central part of the galaxy or a region of protogalactic gas. In fact, the process of the appearance of black holes in this hypothesis is very similar to the first option. Only part of the galaxy collapses under its own weight and not a separate star. This hypothesis is based on scientists' observation that virtually every galaxy has a black hole at its center. This does not agree with the version about the appearance of black holes from collapsing stars. The appearance of black holes at the time of the initial expansion of the universe, the so-called primary black holes. According to this hypothesis, immediately after the Big Bang, the pressure and temperature in space were ultra-high. Under such conditions, simple fluctuations in the density of matter, for example, the beginning of the expansion of the universe, were significantly enough for territories with such gravity to appear. At the same time, most areas with high density moved away from each other due to the expansion of the universe. Cosmologists have also suggested that primordial black holes with masses ranging from 1014 to 1023 kilograms can constitute dark matter. These are the heaviest candidates for dark matter particles. The emergence of black holes in high-energy nuclear reactions. Similar reactions are used to study particles in hadron colliders. In 1784, the English scientist John Mitchell put forward the concept of the existence of a massive body, the gravitational attraction of which is so strong that the speed required to overcome it exceeds the speed of light. The scientists believe that in space there can be many such objects inaccessible to observation. However, this hypothesis was soon forgotten because in the framework of classical physics the speed of light is not of fundamental importance. And only after, in 1905, Albert Einstein in his special theory of relativity SRT, used the developments of Lorentz electrodynamics, the speed of light turned out to be the limit that a physical body can develop. This radically changed the meaning of black holes in theoretical physics. What are the types of black holes? A black star of stellar mass the result from the collapse of a star. Black star of medium mass. This is an intermediate stage of a black hole, which has increased due to the absorption into itself of gas clusters or a neighboring star in systems of paired stars. Supermassive black holes. Objects with rather low density, but with high mass and weak tidal forces. This is the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Ultramassive black holes. A rather rare phenomenon in the universe, but these can be observed in the center of the whole 15A galaxy the brightest in the Abel Cluster of Galaxies. 
Scientists recently discovered an ultra-massive black hole with a mass of 40 billion solar masses. So far, it is the heaviest known object in the universe. Scientists were petrified when in 2021 they discovered the closest black hole to Earth at a distance of 1500 light years from our planet. Wow! They even gave it a name corresponding to the time – Unicorn. Do you know the constellation Aquarius? Telescopes recently spotted a pair of black holes in this constellation. These black holes belong to the heavyweights. The largest one has a mass of 154 million times more than the Sun, and the smaller one is 6.3 million times more massive than our star. They orbit each other at a distance of only 1600 light years and look like they will merge into one giant black hole in 250 million years, scientists believe. The research question deals with one of the most fascinating objects which we have in astrophysics, which are black holes. Black holes are strange objects because they are a place where space and time begin to mix up and mess up, and a, a combination of gravity and quantum mechanics becomes important. And they are very fascinating because every galaxy seems to have a very massive black hole in the very center, and the black hole seems to know about the properties of the galaxies, which nobody can understand. So the black holes give us insight into a very strange world, uh, which seems to be important in order to understand the rest of the universe and where we know nothing about yet. The black hole um, is defined as a black hole because inside a certain region nothing can escape, not even right. That's why it is black. But there's a last stable orbit, which we call the event horizon, outside of which gas can still radiate away. We see the light, and then inside this event horizon, uh, radiation can't make it out. It's called event horizon because it's also the horizon where space and time change their properties. So events change in their sequence of uh, what happens. So this is something very, very funny and unexpected uh, from general relativity. So this event horizon is the holy grail in order to understand black holes. And we want to resolve the event horizon and see what happens there, which means we have to wait for an event at that horizon. We use the same method as uh, meteorologists use on Earth to calculate how the weather is evolving. Uh, we simulate uh, the, the physics of a gas cloud or a gas uh, using hydrodynamic equations, which are known on Earth, Navier-Stokes equations, which is solved iteratively on a computer. So we go step by step and so the weather pattern and the density distribution and the velocity distribution is changing at, uh, with time. We are, have a problem, the galactic center is a very complex place. And so we do not really know all the environment, which is very important if you want to understand how the weather evolves. And so we do a simulation of a cloud moving around the black hole, and then we go to our observer friends, which sit fortunately next door, because at the Max Planck Institute we have this fortunate situation to have the theorists and the observers together. And only if you work together, always uh, interact with the observers and tell you whether you are right or wrong, can you work the complexity of the universe out. So it should be there, should be something like that should exist everywhere. Unfortunately, it's not everywhere like this. Uh, but here we are in Gaiching in the fortunate situation that observers and theorists are strongly interacting. And so we are always kind of uh, being corrected by the observations and by the observers and that helps us to tune our model so that we get the conditions right. And then we calculate iteratively what happens if this gas cloud moves around the black hole in the hope that we will predict when gas creates into the black hole, when an observer has to look carefully to see what happens close to this last stable orbit, close to the event horizon. So our key findings was um, uh, evolving as a function of time. In 2012, this gas cloud was discovered and was still very compact and spheroidal. And then we immediately started calculating that and we predicted the cloud will become a spaghetti. By the gravity of the black hole, it will be torn apart into a very long 
object, it will not fall directly into the black hole, it will move around the black hole, but the strong gravity of the black hole will tear it apart. And that should happen around 2014-15. And indeed, observers were looking and they found something like that. They found the spaghettification uh, of uh, this guy's class. So we were quite happy because we saw that indeed meteorology works in the universe, which we were sure before. Uh, then we predicted, now comes an exciting moment, the gas will fall back and accrete onto the black hole. And if you look carefully, you see the event horizon, which has never ever been seen before. And um, the observers then told us, no, this, the cloud after becoming a spaghetti is now actually compactifying again. So we were rather, rather puzzled about this silly gas cloud not doing what our meteorology equations would predict to do. And we found a reason for this, which is connected to that the cloud has a magnetic field and also that it is consisting of lots of little droplets. So it does not only behave like a gas cloud, it has also some substructure. And including this substructure, we are right now recalculating everything and we predict that this infall will still happen, but it will happen at a later phase um, in, in a couple of years. And that is uh, what the observers now can use to really understand what happens when gas falls in. The black hole is special because it has an event horizon. The event horizon is the place where light can still disappear from the black hole and a little farther in, light is stuck. And the event horizon is a fascinating place. It's a prediction of general relativity, but at the same time, it's a quantum object. Its size is so small that quantum mechanics matters. Now, general relativity and quantum mechanics cannot be unified because general relativity is not part of quantum mechanics and quantum mechanics predicts that everything is extended and general relativity says that the event horizon is infinitely thin. So we expect when gas enters this last stable orbit and the event horizon, we'll see new phenomena which combine general relativity and quantum mechanics in a new theory of quantum gravity and we might learn something about this new and yet unknown theory just when this event happens. The journey is very fascinating because on the observational side, and I told you we are always observe, uh, con connecting to the observers, we now have the Event Horizon Telescope, which is a combination of lots of radio telescopes. You combine them to get a radio telescope as big as the Earth. And with this telescope, once you resolve the Event Horizon, that's what you can do, you will see all kinds of phenomena that will arise at this event horizon. You might get gigantic jets of material being blown out of the center of the galaxy close to the event horizon. That's something we can predict when we simulate the gas falling towards the black hole, maybe including new theory which we have learned about from this first event. These jets are enormously important because they are bigger than a whole galaxy and they might affect the dynamics of the whole galaxy and that brings us uh, to this co fascinating connection between the mass of a black hole and the mass of the galaxy which is strongly correlated. The kinematics of the galaxy is correlated to the black hole in the center and at the moment we don't understand how these tiny objects can mess up a whole galaxy. So we'll learn a lot about how galaxies evolve, maybe even how stars evolve in the galaxies and we might learn something about these supermassive black holes in the first place. They are so massive that they cannot have formed out of a collapsing star. So we have no idea where these black holes come from, how they got all this material they seem to have. And that is a very, very bright future in the next 10 years. The big question was to try to understand the physics fundamental physics behind the information storage capacity of a black hole. Now the point is that black holes are the limit of the information storage per given size. So if I want to send you a message in a, given, in a box of a given size, then I can keep putting there information bits until this message becomes a black hole, collapses into a black hole. This is the limit, because if I try to put more, then this message will just increase, I will get a bigger black hole. So black holes are the biggest limit of information storage per given size. 
so you can think of a black hole as a sequence, as a very long message, a sequence of zeros and ones. And the longest message per size, again. But the, another amazing property, which is highly non-trivial for a black hole, is that to go from message to message, in other words, to rearrange the message, it is the cheapest system. Okay, this is incredible. Okay, so in other words, think in the following way. Think about the book, right? So to create a book, it may cost some energy. And actually, the book itself may be very heavy. Okay? Then in this book, you store information because you write. But you can write one message, then you can erase it and go to a different message, right? This procedure of going from a message to message, okay, rearranging your bits of information, qubits of information, it always costs energy. So the black hole is the cheapest. So the black hole is cheapest in rearranging the message, okay? So in other words, black hole of the given size, of the given mass, has huge number of copies, okay, which differ by this inner message, okay? So it's very hard to distinguish them classically. You have to wait a very long time. This, uh, this is the price to pay for a big message and for a cheap message. But nevertheless, this is the uh, black holes are the, uh, really incredible from the point of view of the how cheap it is to rearrange the zeros and ones. And uh, so the idea was to understand physics behind this, uh, in, maybe in terms of some general phenomena, and then see how unique black holes are in this respect, whether there are other systems of nature that can process information in the same way. Let me describe the method, right? Now, we are theoretical physicists, and we, are, we, we also, the field is fundamental physics. Now, and the, 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 the topic that we are trying to uh, tackle, understand, uh, essentially we are moving in dark, right? So we have certain well-established facts. We are trying to understand what's the underlying fundamental physics behind these facts. So we, I, we are trying to understand black hole information storage in terms of some phenomena of nature, okay? Then the way it works, you get an idea. And the idea is that this phenomenon of nature is quantum criticality of black hole constituents, of gravitons, okay? Now, once you have this idea, then methodology is the following. First, you try to understand consequences of this idea. And secondly, you try to kill the idea. Actually, the two are connected because you can have, once you derive consequences, you can see that these consequences contradict to some obvious facts. Then you are killing the idea. Or you try to kill the idea in a different way. So basically, this goes in parallel. So in the same time, you're trying to develop the idea. From idea, you want to develop it into a theory, okay? Something into, that you can work with, calculate something, predict something, and simultaneously think about the loopholes, okay? What could be that could kill this idea? So that's the methodology. What is new in, in, in our research is that we have understood uh, the physics behind, fundamental physics behind black hole information processing and capacity, information storage capacity, in terms of very general phenomena of nature. And this phenomena of nature is so-called quantum criticality, in this particular case of attractive bosons, of attractive particles, of Bose-Einstein type systems. This is the key finding. So this, is, this means that we have a microscopic theory, okay, based on this idea, this central idea, how black holes work as quantum computers. This is the key. Now, this quantum criticality uh, is precisely what is responsible for appearance of the cheap qubits, which were total mystery before, okay? No, before this was completely, uh, even for us and for everyone, unimaginable how can you have a system with so uh, cheap uh, quantum qubits, okay? Quant I mean, qubits are quantum qubits, of course, uh, uh, information bits, quantum bits. And uh, now we understand this in terms of this quantum criticality. Now, what is quantum criticality? Quantum criticality is the transition, it's a phase transition uh, between different regimes of the system, okay? You can compare it with a with, with group of people or a country or any, any system with many, many constituents can exhibit this type of transition from one regime to the other. And at the transition point, certain things become very peculiar and unusual. And things that are unimaginable in when system is in the stable equilibrium become possible when system is at the transition point. And this is very similar to where, you know, this, this, this comparison. If you have a big country, stable country, normally it's not easy to change hierarchies. Pe people have to work very hard to go up in the hierarchy. But when, if country is in the transition point, revolution or something like that, then 
to change hierarchies becomes very cheap, energetically cheap. And this is also the common <laughs> property of systems of nature. So it's not just about countries, but this is also true in generic. There is a big class of systems, including black holes, which are at this transition point, and that's why they have cheap qubits appearing. So this is the key, and this is new. This finding has relevance in at least in two directions. Okay? Now, first, we are working in fundamental physics, and we are trying to understand nature. The point is that we cannot understand nature of elementary particles. Now, nature, we want to understand at very high energies, at short distances, and we want to understand what are the laws of nature at, at very high energies, let's say, right? This is impossible without understanding black holes. Why? Because gravity is an interaction which is universal, and gravity is an interaction which is becoming strong with energy. So high as the energy in particle collisions, gravity becomes more important. If you want to build a more and more powerful microscope, gravity will inevitably play more and more important role in this process. And most powerful microscope that you can build, is there is a limit to it. Because fine, sooner or later, you cannot resolve distances shorter than the Planck length. And if you try to construct a microscope which is more powerful, it will collapse into a black hole. It's the same thing, okay? So in other words, the black holes are the end point of any high energy particle collision. Okay, this is commonly uh, accepted, this view. But then this is telling you immediately that without understanding black hole quantum physics or black holes, of fundamental physics of black holes, we cannot understand nature. Because there will be a region, high energy region, uh, domain of nature that we will not be able to describe without being able to describe black holes, quantum mechanically. So therefore, you see, it's absolutely important for virtually every problem, that every question that you want to pose in high energy Particle physics will bring you finally to the understanding of black holes. And therefore, this is the key. This is one important thing. It also has implication in cosmology. Why? Because universe, we come from Big Bang. And laws of physics in the early universe were high energy laws of physics. Because back in the past, the universe was hot. The elementary particles were very energetic. And again, the, the, for understanding history of the universe, we have to understand physics at high energies. And again, we cannot do it without understanding black holes. So in other words, how the universe stores information, for example. Okay? This is, we cannot understand without understanding this type of physics. Okay, so this is as far as fundamental importance is concerned. But there are also implications, because this opens up a new direction of the research. Why? Because now we understand that black holes are not unique in the way they process information. There are other systems which exhibit quantum criticality, and these systems you can manufacture in laboratory, and they essentially are doing computation according to the same rules that black holes are doing. Now, this is very important because first it demystifies black holes, okay? Because now we understand that you can have systems that you, that you can manufacture. Moreover, you can study black hole physics by observing these systems. So you can borrow computational skills from black holes, realize them in real labs, laboratories, but also backwards. You can read certain phenomena in laboratories which we were not suspecting before existed. And now we can say, oh, there is a new phenomena. Maybe, let me go, go back and look in, the astro, in astrophysics. Maybe black holes exhibit similar type of phenomena and let me look for it. So it works in both ways. It opens a sort of a new direction of research in which you can sort of use the same phenomena of nature, okay, but in different systems. And some of the systems are much more accessible. And this is very exciting. The question is how to continue this research. So we are thinking in a few directions. Uh, one is, of course, fundamental research. So we should, we must understand better and better, uh, work out this theory in, in more details, try to understand how uh, physics of black hole quantum computing works, both in gravitational systems as well as in condensed matter systems, in, generically in the systems with quantum criticality, as I said. This is one theoretical research direction. It has many sub-directions. Uh, another direction is to, uh, to try to manufacture these type of systems in laboratory and make direct observations on critical systems from the point of view of black hole based quantum computing. Uh, this is very exciting. Of course, here we need, I'm a theoretical physicist, we need uh, help from our experimental colleagues. 
So we are um, discussing with, uh, with them, uh, trying to understand what would be the right systems of nature in, in which we can do this type of experiments. There are a few candidate systems that we are thinking about, in particular cold atoms, because we, it seems that in cold atoms we can manufacture the systems which, with attraction and with criticality, so we can sort of repeat the same physics that uh, takes place in the black hole quantum computing. And uh, this is very exciting research. Um, ex essentially experimental, uh, and uh, there is third direction in which we try to understand what can be seen in the sky, um, in real black holes, what are the predictions from this inner structure that could be observed by astrophysical observations. Okay, so that, this is another very interesting question. Again, there we need help from our uh, observer, astro, astro observers, uh, from our colleagues that are doing uh, astrophysical observations. This will be really uh, very exciting to see a, a, a trace of or, or a signature of, of black hole quantum hair <laughs> okay, in, in, in uh, astrophysical observations. Okay, we are in the process of studying it, trying to understand what, what could be seen. And yet another direction is uh, cosmological. So try to apply these ideas to cosmology and see, just in the same way as black hole encodes quantum computational messages, okay, whether the universe itself, which is very much like black hole, early universe, how the early universe was storing quantum information, okay? And whether one can read out some of this information, which is now stored in fabric of, the, of, of space time. I hope you have enjoyed this episode of Freak Physics. Please like, share, and subscribe to help Freak Physics continue to provide free content. To see more, go to freakphysics.com.